if hmm. Marico has to enter a completely new industry, like yeah. leave FMCG. Yeah. And you have to lead True. it again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What would that industry be today and why? Our today's guest is someone who I have aspired and looked up to since I was a kid because I wanted to build an FMCG business and this guy turned a small family business and made it into a multi-billion dollar industry. Today, he's a billionaire, he's an entrepreneur, he's an oil king of the country. He made oil a synonym with his brand. Most of the people don't even know that there's a thing called coconut oil which exists. People only know that there's parachute oil. People don't even know that there's edible oil which exists. People only know that it's Safola oil. This guy has built brands which has become synonyms with the entire category. And he keeps on building brands after brands after brands and kept on investing in so many different things. So you need to understand this person because he understands something about Indian customers which many few people have been able to decode. So how can you understand Indian customers? How can you identify the right strengths and problems which you have as an entrepreneur? How can you go for those, those problems? Try to find out solutions and capture the entire market. How is India different? How can you create wealth? And in the end, we've also talked about his book where he has written down everything about his life, about his entrepreneurial journey, about his next ventures, and how any of the people who want to grow and excel in their lives can start doing it from today itself. Make sure that you watch this episode till the end and you buy his book as well because the book has so many more golden nuggets which you can't even imagine. So we're going to dive in directly into the question answers. Okay. Sure. I have a very, like very cliche question in the beginning because there are a lot of young entrepreneurs and young business owners who are watching this. And maximum of them are family business owners, right? Yes. They're all starting small businesses and your journey started similarly, yeah. right? What is that first step which somebody should take in order to build like a billion dollar business from their small family business? <laughs> so I think it just uh, doesn't happen automatically. There is a certain process, as you said, uh, one has to follow. And that process starts with identifying what is the opportunity. Okay. And if you have to identify an opportunity to create a new business, then you have to have a very deep understanding of consumer needs. So the first step uh, is broadly in what area, what is my strength, what am I good at? And uh, depending on that, identify some broad business opportunity. It okay. could be IT, it could be pharma, it could be FMCG, it could be anything, hmm. or it could be service industry. But that broad identification is required that where do I need to go? I think that is the starting point. Having done that, then within that category of business, what is the unique thing you're bringing to the consumer? Uh, because it's a highly competitive environment. And if you offer a me to product, you will not succeed because the consumer will ask, what is unique about what you're offering? Yeah. I can get the same thing from my current whatever supplier or wherever I'm buying from. And I want something unique, innovative, pioneering. So then the process starts with interacting with consumers. If you have an idea of bringing in unique offering, then you can explore that with the consumer and develop that idea because many times you may have a blind spot. Yeah. You may think that you have a great opportunity, but the con it doesn't cut ice with the consumer. So it's very important to have a close interaction with the consumer, refine the idea based on the inputs received from the consumer, again go back to the consumer, develop a product while, if you are in a product business, while interacting with the consumers, and again give it to them. So there is a lot of iterations take place between you and the consumer before you finally launch a product or a service. True. And I think that's very well invested because if you don't do a proper homework in terms of identifying an opportunity, creating a unique offering which appeals to the consumer, your chances of success are much, much lesser. And if you are able to identify what is that sweet spot with the consumer, is it big enough for me to grow? Then it's, I think that is the starting point. So I think I call that uh, how do you create a right to win? Okay. You have to create a right to win in a highly competitive environment. Mm -hmm. And that can happen through innovation. 
it can happen through starting something new which nobody else has done um or it could be depending on the kind of business you are in it could be a patent if you are a, a pharma company you done something research which you patented which others cannot copy or it could be some unique service offering in a service industry which others are not doing for example dominos and they are supplying pizza with the uniqueness came in terms of offering good pizza within a certain time frame yeah and if they don't deliver within that time frame they were willing to give it for free give it for free and that to me is giving it for free was the biggest unique factor it was not 15 minutes they would have said and then sometimes they would have uh-huh. taken 25 30 minutes here mm-hmm. they had a clear direction that okay if i don't deliver within that time frame i will have to give it free yeah and that cut ice of course the quality of the pizza has to be good yeah. you can't offer <laughs> you offer a sub optimal quality product but the unique thing which they identified was a certain time frame and they were willing to back it up by giving a refund so i think the key thing is to identify what is unique which you are bringing in and then you know explore that you will go through a lot of learning curve because most entrepreneurs when they think on an idea it doesn't appeal to the consumer or you need to refine the idea so you have to go on prototyping that do it in a small way when you have ultimately an offering again learn from that because you are offering many things you are offering the product you are offering if you are you are offering a packaging you are offering a brand name you are offering a pricing so it has to fit in with all the parameters you know if you have price it too high then the consumer will reject do they may like the product yeah if they don't like the brand name or packaging again it will not cut ice so you are testing all the parameters if you are in a product business starting with the product itself packaging pricing communications advertising a lot uh, of it. so everything and again in that prototype phase you may want to change something which does not appeal to the, the consumer feedback. and once you get a good grip that yes now this is cutting ice then you can start expanding and putting in more resources to to succeed in the business but it's a very iterative process and many a times the uh, entrepreneurs they themselves don't have all the answers so you have to interact with the consumers you have to interact with the people you are you are working with and that's how an idea develops and you know that's how it gets executed so now i have two questions based on your answer okay hmm. number one the first question is that when you started okay hmm. at that time most of the young people what they think is oh i have a family business i have to join this only yes okay they don't think about what are my strengths they don't yes. think about how can i help my family business grow yes. or what is that thing that i can find out in the customer or the problem or the consumer need right yes at that point what should they do before joining the business yes so that they learn and they have a certain understanding at least this much self awareness that okay this is my strength yeah I'm going to go and change this maybe yes. if that takes turn around the entire business into something yeah. new yeah. or maybe doing something inside the business yeah. operations which are going on yeah. and what was that one thing for you yeah. how did you identify yeah. it so it's a very good question because i think most people young people they don't identify their strengths and many times most of us don't know what our strengths are uh, you may have it in you but you not identified that this is my strength so my first step whether you are joining a business family business or you are taking up a career is to identify your own strengths okay. and that can come when you interact with people who know you your family members your close friends the best thing is to get them together about 8 10 of them whoever you are they know you very well i mean you can't just get any outsider to you but they have to know you well and ask them to brainstorm what are my strengths and what are my weaknesses and hopefully that will give you a picture in terms of what your strengths are and many of us as i said have blind spots so that blind spots will be overcome so it's not only necessary to identify your strengths but which areas you're not so good at okay so my second hypothesis is that if you are leveraging your strengths and doing something which is based on your strengths your chances of enjoying that journey are much more Mm-hmm. because your strength is something normally it gets converted into a passion yeah if you're good in talking to people now you've gone into this <laughs> podcast and all because that's that's you enjoy doing it you yeah. know so i'm you have to enjoy what you're doing your career your business it has to be fun so, and if it is based on your own strengths then there are higher chances of you succeeding 
then looking at something because it's the flavor of the season or flavor of the decade. For example, a few years back, IT industry or now digital revolution. Of course, there are great opportunities in digital space today. But if you're not good in digital space, you should not go into that because that's not your strength. Yeah. And you'll be competing with many others who have strengths in the digital space. You may not have it. So your chances of success may not be there. True. So, but I strongly believe that every person in this world has some God-given gifts. Every person. Okay. And the key thing is to identify what those God-given gifts are mm. and to improve on those God-given gifts. Because if you have strengths and if you start improving on that, and that improving learning is a perpetual journey. I mean, Process. you can go on learning until the last day of your life. But most of us, they tend to look at, okay, this is my weakness, so let me try and improve on my weakness. I have a 75-25 rule. 75% of your effort should go in improving your strengths. 25% in improving your weaknesses. Well, that's interesting. Because your chances of success in improving your strength are much higher than your chances of success in improving your weaknesses. Unless you have some fatal flaws. If you have some fatal flaws, then you have to improve that weakness. Yeah. But if you don't have any fatal flaws, then it's better to concentrate on improving strengths and leveraging your whole career, business, whatever your future, based on your strengths. This makes sense because, you know, I remember like as a kid, my mom and dad, they used to tell me that number one and that eventually turned out to be like my go-to ticket to start learning yeah, more yeah, about yeah. talking learning more about the entire business yeah, of talking yeah, yeah. and that eventually became my strength and then eventually we ended up having yeah. a passion to do the business okay. but I'm glad you know I'm just interjecting I'm glad your parents asked you to do something which appealed to you Unfortunately, in the Indian society, most parents are asking children to do something because it is their passion yeah. or because it is the flavor of, and there is great opportunity in digital business or IT business. But you have to look at, does it is it for me or not, you know? And they expect that every person will succeed if you go into IT. That doesn't happen, you know. No, it, you have to have an offering irrespective of the potential in that space. And you have to be good at it. So now that you talked about like you were you always wanted to build a consumer-led business, okay? What is that one thing about Indian customers or Indian consumers which every young person should know today? So I think, first of all, India is a big country. It's yeah. like having 30 different countries because each state has a different consumer profile. Yeah. It has a different user profile, depending again on what kind of consumer product you're going in, especially when it comes to food. Every state has a different food preference, you know. Some Gujaratis may like sweet food, some Andhraites may like spicy food. So the key thing is not to look at Indian consumer from one lens. You have to look at it from different lenses depending on where you want to market that product. Mm. And each state may have a different preference. For example, a product like, I was told, I, Horlicks does mainly well in South, you know. Yeah. Because that's the preference of that, that area, you know. So you need to identify what works, especially when it comes to consumer preferences, where and not to treat Indian consumer from one lens. Mm -hmm. You have to look at Indian consumer from virtually from different segments. You can look at state-wise cut. You can look at, a, because the consumer is changing very fast, urban, rural, you can look at a young, old, millennials, Z custom. So there are, I think, many, many segments one can look at. And because the consumer size is very large, you just need to identify what is the opportunity you want to pursue and do inciting with that sharply defined opportunity rather than looking at Indian consumer from a wide lens. But isn't it difficult to build like a national brand when you are dealing with so many diverse set of cons consumers, especially let's say language barriers, right? I've seen, I went to UP, Bihar, that side. Yeah. They have a very Hindi-oriented packaging, True. which is not relevant in the South market. South True. has a very local language, ma ma yeah. uh, you know, packaging. Yeah. So different colors appeal people, different perfumes, different fragrances appeal different kind yeah. of people. Yeah. So how do you build like one brand? Like Parachute is one brand which connects India. <laughs> like, I, I was talking to this too about my dad that, you know, my dad was like, most of his friends mm. don't even know that it's called coconut oil. Yeah. Like they know it's parachute. Correct. So how is it? And it's same from south to yeah, east to yeah, west to yeah, north. Yeah. So I think, again, good question. Depending on the category you are present in, you may do with a product which appeals to across India. Luckily, in coconut oil, 
that product appeals, similar product appeals to people from South, West, North, East. So there is no differentiation. But as I said earlier, in terms of food, food is highly localized. Yeah. You know, and I'll give you an example. You know, we launched Safola Masala Oats. Hmm. And we said that can, so we said that how, how do we decide the taste? What kind of flavors do we need to give? So we did inciting uh, with consumers in South and different parts, different states and try to determine what are their preferences. So we have regional, within the Safola Masala Oats, we have regional offerings. For example, in Tamil Nadu, we will have a Pongal Oats. Okay. Which will not sell well in so mm-hmm. and but maybe in in uh, in West we'll sell pav bhaji oats, you know, because pav bhaji ah. is sold. So you try and determine those variants, but there are some variants which cuts across all India. For example, mas- plain masala oats, normal like a masala oats, it cuts across every state. Every state, but then there are other, certain other variants which are only specifically required for that particular state. And the key thing is to identify them, depending again on consumer insight and consumer preferences. So your first big product was parachute oil, right? Parachute and Safola oil, Safola. yes. Safola. Yeah. So how, was it difficult for northern customers to convince them? Because coconut is very well used and popular in the south. So in north, it's not that popular, right? It was, I think earlier it was different kind of oils that they were using. So I think it goes on varying. And uh, the overall usage of coconut oil varies uh, from different in different parts of India. So South and West are bigger markets, hmm. followed by East and followed by North. So one has to realize, okay, there is a consumer preference and I need to concentrate more on, on the South and East, South and West market, which are the bigger opportunities. So I have to, so my first expansion happened in West, then we went to South and then North and East. Okay. So now I have one more, like, is there a specific rule? or something which goes beyond or which can be applicable to every FMCG business or every business. Like I'll tell you one rule. Mm. Like I had a rule, I read it somewhere that in order to build an FMCG business, you need to keep in, uh, like when it comes to distribution, you need to keep in mind three things, access, availability, and awareness. Yeah. Like you need to have products which are available from sure, small sure, sachet yeah, to big. Yeah, yeah. Awareness should be everywhere and yeah. it should be available. Yeah. This is one rule. Yeah. Do you have any certain rule that should be followed by everyone or which will make life easier for everybody? No, I think a lot depends on the category you're present in and to what extent is the opportunity for the category. You know, there are certain categories where the opportunity only will be in a certain parts of the country. It need not be whole of Bombay. It could be only in South Bombay, for example. Okay. So a lot depends on what is your consumer. Hmm. And you need to define that consumer, the profile of the consumer and how big is the opportunity. And depending on that, of course, these three rules apply. But the in the last two, three years, we've seen emergence of so-called D2C brands, yeah. which are direct-to-consumer brands. Mm-hmm. Now, they have overturned a lot of the earlier, shall I say, parameters of launching a new product because many of the entry barriers which existed earlier, um, entry barriers in terms of um, scale of distribution, in terms of number of shops one had to, to cater to, uh, in terms of the advertising money required to promote a brand, especially in, in national brands, you know, national advertising, television, press, which was very expensive. Yeah. Now, those entry barriers have gone because you can market the product through D2C. D2C e-commerce sites. You can need not do mass advertising. You can do digital marketing. So we have seen even so many new brands which have... Uh, which have emerged out of this D2C opportunity. And many of them have actually gone into extensions, which the earlier mindset of brand extension should be in a similar Mm. broad areas. Now, many brands have gone beyond what the normal traditional mindset was. They've disrupted the norms. They disrupted. And because they have a very close relationship with the communities they are catering to. And as long as there is a potential for that, them to leverage those communities, they are able to do so. Yeah. So I have a fun question before I ask you another serious one is, do you have a personal fascination towards becoming like an oil king or something <laughs> like that? <laughs> because you recently acquired a D2C brand, which is also dealing yeah, with the yeah, beard oil, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So 
Is no, there no. anything like actually have... on the contrary, I don't want to get away from the oil. So <laughs> over a period of time, our our contribution from oils has gone down. Okay. Because the the differentiation and the value addition in oils is limited, mm. and if it is limited, then others ability to copy you mm. will be high. So you need to have a very strong brand. Uh, or some strengths in the brand or emotional connect, connect with the consumer which will help you retain the consumers uh, and if you go into more value added <clears throat> premiumized category of personal care foods healthy offerings then to that extent uh, others ability to copy you because it is complex will be limited yeah so on the contrary i want to move away from and go more into healthy beauty wealth and beauty wellness and beauty wellness are and the beauty. two parameters i would like to expand you know oh yes. yeah how huh, like i now i've been analyzing and looking at all the steps marico has made over the years is more towards wellness and yeah. Uh, yeah. beauty segment yeah, because the overall i think overall contribution of parachute safola as as percentage to sales also has gone down over a period of time yeah. at one stage parachute was like 70% of our turnover i don't remember now but it must be about 40% now ooh yeah it's gone down quite a lot that's insane yeah <laughs> so now you said like in order to build a brand or in order to stand out in the competitive market you need to have like a very good consumer insight yes right in the beginning in the beginning like now you have like a vast like a range of people you can go to states you can go to you can have a consumer sampling yeah, you have yeah, a you yeah. have a budget for it yeah. everything is there in the beginning we don't have the budget yeah we don't have like yeah. who are the people we should go talk to is it like just like go talk to friends and family or how how is it happening like in the beginning how do you talk and get the consumer itself i think the key thing is what what is your consumer you need to define you know you may be offering something which is for a certain income profile certain uh, educational okay. profile certain um, i mean urban rural kind of a Got you it. need to be very clear what Is broadly in terms of what is your target audience and un- because otherwise it's very large number of consumers mm-hmm. you need to define that and talk to them you know the more sharply you define the consumer the better it is because then you'll get a better picture in terms you may say okay my consumer is all india like parachute mm-hmm. everybody is my consumer yeah. parachute is consumed from the lowest parameter in terms of bottom of the pyramid to the to the highest yeah uh, so it's uh, but most products when the a new products you will have to target your your potential customer and you know work with that customer and then you can see okay can i go on expanding that consumer from this to this you know so do you, do you feel in the beginning when people start right they feel if i'm not catering let's say men then yeah. i'm missing out on like a large population if i'm not catering on urban i'm missing out on a large so that's why people say that i don't want to define my customer my customer is everyone my product is for everyone so do you think that's a bad thing to do or so uh, you know the more widely you define a consumer the more difficult it will be for you to have that right to win because those categories would have been occupied by somebody else yeah for example shampoos hmm. you know shampoos everybody uses shampoo you know urban rural now male female so but if you have something unique in that category something which is like cut size with all the leading brands and again dominated by multinationals global brands very difficult for you to succeed in a category like shampoo unless you have a truly remarkable product which mm-hmm. is unique and which is cutting edge you know uh, so it's easier to say that uh, let me go to large categories but difficult to succeed the chances of success are higher in certain segments where the larger players have not entered those markets for example we acquired this brand beard you know yeah it is only products for beard now the big players would not go into beard because it's, it's not a very, very large yeah, yeah relatively small for them you know it's 100 crore brand now but the large players would not go and so the, the this newer segments where there are opportunities to to succeed to enter are those segments which are not occupied by others Mm-hmm. so the key thing is to look at where can again i'll go back to do i have right to win and my hypothesis is that the right to win will be easier in segments which are not looked at by larger players because it's too small for them to occupy and that's where their potential may be and that's 
if you look at your history of acquiring it it has always been like small categories which can be turned into like live on happened yes it was because like a small category you are absolutely right so uh, you know i don't know whether you read the book uh, blue ocean you know blue ocean is a book talked about again what is your right to win you need to identify oceans where you can win mm-hmm. and uh, these are the spaces where we thought that you know compared to i mean i could have said that i want to get into wash category yeah wash category means basically wash category means in hair wash shampoos and conditioners yeah highly dominated by mnc's multiple brand each of them will have three four brands global brands global r&d your chance to win will be very limited because you are not offering anything unique and the scale with which they do it the kind of money they are putting in advertising again you will have to fight with big giants so i don't have a strong right to win so True. these are not these are red ocean spaces for me so the blue ocean spaces for me were where they had those brand but they for them it was like not that con- so we said that can we look at pre and post wash hair care mm-hmm. so post wash hair care is hair gels hair creams hair serums pre washes ayurvedic hair oils some of the hair oils which are good for nourishment mm. and i think our space was there so we said let's not compete mainly in the wash category but go into pre and post post wash and we should get market leadership in whatever we do in pre and post wash and that's what we were able to do so oh that's a good thing that's that's a very good insight for most of the small businesses who are like regional players yes today who are running family businesses they are in the regional category they must be very big in their own cities or states and now if they want to go out they should think about beyond like what is pre and post yeah that's a very good insight because let's say let's talk about detergent right mm. so my my family business very dominant in one city yeah, a, yeah. for detergent we are leaders <laughs> like we are we are okay. beating the mnc's as well there okay but outside that city or state we are not we are nowhere correct because those the mnc's are dominating so correct. there we can think about pre and post ah. and that can be a okay. good way to enter at least or at least let people know that oh we exist yeah. and once they know that we exist and our products are good they might end up buying our normal products as well okay that's a that's a great uh, you know advice for a lot of people who are listening to this particular podcast so now that you've built like a big business right like this is not easy to run and there are thousands of people yeah. involved in the business yeah. who are the top 5 people you talk to every day and what are their <laughs> roles <laughs> in order to take so like I, every day i don't talk to top because now my role has changed you know earlier i was the managing director hmm. so as managing director i would talk to people who were reporting to me yeah like a functional structure head of marketing head of sales head of hr whatever but i think in each business you need to determine what are the value creators you know because you have a functional structure but there are certain functions or there are certain parts of the business which add much more value to you there will be some other functions which are important but not they don't add that much value for example in an fmcg business what creates value very good quality product so the product development hmm. consumer insighting and marketing because they create brands advertise yeah. create the and sales and distribution so if i am an fmcg business i have to invest best quality talent get the best quality talent in sales marketing and r development other functions and of course hr will help me in doing that but finance supply chain are important i am not saying not important but these three are more important because they ultimately create a lot of value for you they mm-hmm. create that business you know so normally in if i look back at my marketing or my managing director days i would interact more with marketing and sales mm-hmm. uh relatively compared to say factory management and things like that because that's where we were able to create value that's a brilliant insight because i think everybody should look into their business and their culture like what are the value creators for me correct and they absolutely. should absolutely they should and it will differ depending on the kind of business you mm. are in you know for example pharma business will be patents you know in a business like kaya it's customer service it is it is doctors opening in value because doctors create customers you know for you so yeah. how do you deal with doctors and things like that yeah. so every business will have a different value creator Correct. and those value creators Correct. i mean yeah media will have different fmcg will have different pharma Correct. will have a different Correct, yeah. 
that's a good insight that's i think after this podcast i'm going to write down like my <laughs> value creators and then going to think about it a <laughs> lot so it's a hypothetical question which we ask to every of sure. our guests yeah. if hmm. marico has to enter a completely new industry like yeah. leave fmcg yeah and you have to lead sure. it again okay <laughs> <laughs> what would that industry be today and why is it marico or is it me you let's yeah. say just yeah. like let's say you so again i'll go back to my original thing i have to be in businesses which are not easy <laughs> for me to understand not technology led licensing is not required b2b is not required luckily in india now post 91 all the reforms have taken place so the licensing part has gone down quite yeah. a lot you know so i would again look at consumer product because that's what i enjoy doing it i understand customers interacting with them and i would look at consumer facing businesses mm. which uh, either i built it up on my own or to give an example of my son you know he know. is uh, he is not uh, day to day is not managing marico he is on board of marico but he is an investor in many consumer facing businesses yeah. which are done exceedingly well so his ability to identify who are the good entrepreneurs can i help them in terms of not only investing but otherwise adding value to them so we are investors in uh, nike hmm. investors in mama earth we are investors in i think mccafe and many others you know so i think that's the route he has taken you know uh, not managing it on their own but investing and in, you know helping those entrepreneurs succeed so i would say anything to do consumer facing is something which is my passion and i would do that you would do that yeah. you have not thought about like if there is one thing one industry i'll pick up no only consumer no, based whatever but that's my strength i should not get swayed by somebody else because they've done exceedingly well in that area i don't think one should do that you know what mm. are you enjoying you know ultimately you, you should be able to succeed your chances of success are much more if you are enjoying or you understand that certain category of business uh, those potential in that may not be as much in some other businesses but you should be able to succeed in that business. so are you saying that let's say everybody is talking about oh fintech is future edtech is future I would you never should not do look that. that i would never do that because i don't understand that business how will mm. i succeed if i don't understand mm. and one should not cryptocurrency right. i don't know anything about crypto many people have wanted to invest i said i am not going to touch crypto irrespective of the potential is just not investing but when to invest when to divest i don't understand that this is better to be out of that wow that's a very that's i think the best answer i've gotten till now i'm not kidding okay because everyone i talk to every entrepreneur mm. they all have their favorite industry they're like oh india's leading towards this revolution so mm. people should look into this industry people should get to health tech or this or that you have given an answer stop thinking about which is going to be the biggest industry start thinking about where can you be the biggest correct absolutely and right yeah that's that's the best answer anybody could give <laughs> <laughs> well now talk about your book okay hmm. the first thing i want to talk about is when did you decide that you want to cover your life story and write a book <laughs> <laughs> so the seeds of writing a book came when i started speaking at various uh, events or uh, various companies or conferences or whatever you know and uh, every time i would speak something and the people would come to me saying why don't you write your own thing and so that was at the back of my mind so when i stepped down as the managing director i said that okay now i may have some time because i am not the kind of person who cannot do any i have to work every day so i said now let me just start developing this idea in writing a book but i underestimated the challenge in writing a book it's it's a very tough thing especially if you have to write a good book it's very tough you know? yeah you have to appeal to the consumer you have to have the right language the structuring of the book so it, the idea came in then it took a long long time for me to execute that idea because i was not happy i went through multiple iterations not happy i went on changing people who were helping me how much time did it take you to write it it's long i mean it didn't happen the idea came in 2014 15 i mean i started writing my first 2015 but it's and then again it took a little bit of a break i was not happy then i went to somebody else not happy i went on changing you know <laughs> uh who could help me so but i went through i made some mistakes i must mm. say i could have done it in much shorter time 
but uh, I'm now happy the way it's come out. I'm very happy actually. The response to the book also has been phenomenal. It's uh, got a rating of I think 280. Amazon uh, people have reviewed the book, a rating of 4.6 on a 5 point wow. scale. So which is very, very good. Very Those who have written, re read the book, and I thought the book is only for entrepreneurs. But when I, a lot of my friends, I gave it, their spouses have read, they have told me, phenomenal, their children have read. So it's actually appeals to not only entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, professionals who are working in organizations, the students in management, but housewives and things like that, because there are learnings in, in the book, you know, mm. and very nicely captured learnings from Professor Ramcharan, who is the co-author of the book. So after each chapter, he is summarized what are the learnings, what are the insights in my journey, which and many, many failures are also covered in the book. So now, because of the failures, you kept it harsh realities. Why did you keep the name? Yes, to some extent. I I mean, I was, I wanted I to the write name. the book. Like just, yeah. Let me just I tell also you, like, love the love name. The name. I also love the name and not only the name, but the cover of the book also. I love mm -hmm. it. I just ran a, so I, I'm helping entrepreneurs, you know, through my mm -hmm. Ascent initiative. So I said that, let me just, I gave them the manuscript and ran an internal kind of a, not a contest, but from some, can you suggest names, you know? And I got many, many suggestions. And one of the suggestions was this, I loved it. So we, not only me, me, my wife, everybody loved it. So we decided to. And it's a pun on my name, yeah, which was very, very good. And it's easily memorable. So it's a fantastic fit. And same thing if you look at the cover of the book, you know, normally when you go to a publisher, in my case, uh, Random House, they have a department where they come out with multiple covers. And they did that. I was not happy. And then somebody suggested that there is a lady who only specializes in book covers, nothing else. Okay. So I went to her and she read the manuscript. She met me. She got a deep understanding of what I was and said that, can I reflect his personality as well as what is written in the book in through the cover? So if you look at the cover, it's very minimalistic, very simple. Yeah. And I'm relatively, I think I'm a simple person. Very uh, innovative because it has outer and inner part and very transparent. Mm. So it fitted into innovation, transparency, and simplicity. Uh, and, and that's that, how the cover came in. So I, I got very good feedback about not only what's written in the book, but also the name as well as the cover. And I think that makes it for the overall experience. I, I read the line, judge the book by its cover. Correct. You're right. <laughs> so it truly reflects that. Yeah. So in your but I have, I'm ready to take a bet. Anybody who buys the book today, mm -hmm. any of your reader or any of your viewer, buys the book and they're not happy, I'm willing to give a refund. Because I have got, I mean, everybody loved the book, you know. Wow. So now in your, in your book, you have also mentioned about traveling across the India to understand consumers and their preferences. Yes. Right. So how does this help an entrepreneur? And where all did you travel? In fact, I think we should better frame it. Okay. Huh. Uh, it's, could you tell like a specific story from your travel that helped you a lot? <laughs> So different parts of, you know, I, I think my travel was for two reasons. One is to set up a distribution network. I didn't have any, I didn't have any, shall I say, background in FMCG. So I had to set up, I had to travel to interior markets to identify a distributor, go to the trade. And in my initial days, I went to Maharashtra first, Gujarat, and one would not, uh, there were no hotels available in small towns like Amaravati and all. I'm talking of 30, 40 years back, you know. So I've traveled with this. I've stayed at distributed houses themselves, you know. <laughs> so, you know, those kind of the bonding really helped. And once I remember I traveled after a few years, I went to UP and one had to travel and train and all that. So I've done all the rough work, you know, in terms of going to small town, travel and train. And then those guys, some guys in the train with guns and all that. I, to, <laughs> I got really scared. I said. <laughs> so, I mean, these are the two things which come to my mind, you know. Like sleeping. How was it? Like, what was the first reaction when you saw somebody with a gun? It's like, was scary, it? <laughs> but I mean, I said, okay, this is a part and parcel of what happens. In that did you, part did you the, talk to oh, someone yeah. who was like carrying a gun? Yeah, yeah. Boy. The people who were traveling with me in field force, you know, but they said, don't worry, nothing will happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, also in your book, like you have, you've talked about, and it shows that you're a lifelong learner considering the way you have innovated things and improved on your products again and again and again, right? 
So what is that one reason or what is that one thing which keeps your curiosity alive even today? Because even today you're generating and talking to a lot of innovative or innovation led businesses. Mm. So what is that curiosity which still keeps you alive? I think maybe it is genetic. It's difficult for me to to identify what is it, but I enjoy doing it and I'm able to apply some of the learnings to my own business or something else. So I would have say a competition or combination of genetic the process of doing it is is enjoyable and number 3 it's relevant for some opportunity mm that makes sense yeah. so this is the last segment of our uh, conversation and this is you have to answer like very quickly okay okay so i'm going to ask you three it's questions like a rapid, rapid fire, fire okay. kind of like very yeah. not rapid fire but like an elongated so Thick. you have to like quickly okay right? yeah so number one question mm. uh, which one is the favorite chapter from your book and why one chapter on culture building because it's very unique you know it's very important to create a strong culture to win in the marketplace is there any personal reason for it no i myself have developed the culture in mariko many many years back before many other organizations started doing it and, and i think that has paid off your dividends okay if you have to become an assistant of somebody hmm. for one day who would it be i would say now the person is not there somebody like steve jobs or elon musk because they are very innovative you know so and that's uh, the reason yeah. and how they are able to drive that scale which is like unimaginable <laughs> <laughs> okay so if you have to charge somebody to become their assistant and you need to have your hourly rate what would be your hourly rate for that <laughs> well i am currently i i get uh, shall i say i get uh, i'm a part of uh, some other private equity companies as an advisor so my rate is if i convert that hmm. it's uh, about 1 lakh per hour okay oh lovely <laughs> <laughs> that makes that makes us a lot of that gives us a lot of juice hmm. the last question is you have to quickly answer and this is a difficult one hmm. okay what would be that one advice you would give me to improve this <laughs> this particular entire podcast which i want to improve now hmm to identify the right entrepreneur i think to me because ultimately it's the story mm. i must say from whatever you have done first time i met you your questioning is very insightful i have very little to add value but you have done enough homework you've done the right point out the right questions your reactions are very good but the key thing is to identify the right people who can add value and i don't know how good because i have not seen many of you but you if you identify the right people then it will just cut ice with the with your viewers perfect yeah. thank you so much it was pleasure having yeah. you i it's truly like an honor and a dream dream come true because there were only four or five people who i used to look up to when i was building my fmcg business you were oh, one of them oh, thank you. it feels really good thank, thank, you. thank you so much for thank doing you. this thank i you. hope you your book yeah, is already yeah. doing good yeah, it's doing well doing well and I it should do like yeah. way better than anything yeah, else yeah yeah good thank you so much good hmm?